Father, meet me here. My life for all of your glory, your grace, let it surround me. Let faith change the seated this morning. Well, good morning. I'm so glad that you guys are all here today, and uh, it's exciting to be in church this morning, and uh, I know it's uh, the weekend after a holiday, but man, we're happy that you're here, and I'm especially glad this weekend because we've got some some friends. They might as well be family visiting with us from Missouri, and Steve and Marcy and Noah are here, and that's a family that when we were uh, lowly youth pastors down in Missouri, they pretty much adopted my family, and they have spoiled my kids, and they have loved on us, and they've been such a huge encouragement to my family and I, and we're excited. When they, got to, they came into town, we got to see them and spend time with them, and I'm glad you guys are here, and thank you for being here with us, and hopefully you guys get a chance to shake their hands and meet them uh, this morning. But hey, everybody, when you came in, you should have got a little packet, and in that packet was a connection card. Go ahead, and everybody pull out your connection card right now. Because I, I want to talk through this for just a minute because um, we would love to connect with you. And maybe this is your first time here with us at Morningstar Baptist Church. And I just want you to know that you're not just welcomed here, you're wanted. And we're glad that you're here. And we would love to follow up with you. And here's how we do that. We don't show up at your house, I promise. Um, but we do like to mail you a gift card as our way of saying thank you for visiting with us. And maybe you don't like free stuff, that's fine. Don't fill it out. But if you do... Uh, at least put your name and your address on there, and I would love to send you a card telling you thank you for coming, and this is our way of saying thank you, give you a little, a little gift um, so you know that we're excited that you're here. And if you're a regular attender or a member, we ask you at least put your name and your email address on there because we have a lot of stuff going on at our church, and we'll make sure you have information about it, that you're staying up to date on it, and, uh, and we can communicate with you. And what you can do is you can go ahead and fill it out right now. You don't have to wait for me to stop talking, and you can drop that off and the offering plate when they come by here in just a minute. And if that's not enough time for you, there's a wooden crate back here in the back. You can just drop it off in there along with the, along with the pen and the, the packet if you don't need that. Uh, but we do encourage you to fill it out and turn that in. And on the back, it has a place for you to put some prayer requests. Because the men of our church meet together every Tuesday morning at 630, and we pray for the things that are written on here. And we would love to come alongside you and pray with you and for you of whatever has God laid on your heart. So feel free to fill that out and turn it in there. And maybe you've been coming for a while and you're like, man, it's time for me to come join and be a member of the church. If you want to do that, write on their new members class because we've got a new, a new members class coming up July 21st. And we, ought, we, we provide lunch, we provide childcare, and it's about an hour long right after the service on Sunday morning where you can learn more, more about Morningstar. And we would invite you 
to come be a part of that. So you can put new members class on there and we'll make sure we, we, we follow up with you on that. Also, we have, we're doing a church directory, for those of you who didn't know. Um, mainly, it's selfish reasons. It helps us because then we can put faces with names because we're growing and we have a lot more new people and it helps us in the office keep, okay, that's who that is. And, and we can put that in our database. But you get a free photo out of it. So if you have not signed up to take your photo, uh, please contact the office today. You can email them at office at morningstardayton.org office at morningstardayton.org and Meredith will do a great job of getting you signed up and get you on there. You don't have to be a member to take a photo, by the way. This is open to all regular attenders and members. We want to we wanna be able to share that with you and you get a free photo out of the deal. So dress your kids up, drag them on with you, threaten them to smile and uh, 20 minutes and you're done and you get a free photo. So make sure you do that. Uh, the other thing is, for a lot of you might know, we've got a missions trip coming up at the end of August. And we're taking a trip to Guatemala and you've heard me say it every week, and I'm going to say it again until we're sick of hearing it. And here's the challenge to our church, is I'm challenging you to either go or give so someone can go in your place. That we're going to Guatemala to go down there and catch a vision and a burden for worldwide missions. Because, listen, if we're not a missions church, we're not a church. We're just a club that meets on Sunday in a really nice building with really nice people. But we've been called to do more than that. And I want our church to be a missions church. And I'm inviting you to come be a part of that missions trip. But if you can't, I understand, scheduling might not work out. But if that's the case, then give so someone can go in your stead. And then next time, maybe you can go on the trip with us. It's the end of August. And if you'd like to have more information about that, you can write missions trip on the back of your Connect card. And we'll follow up with you on that. Um, if you'd like to give towards it, you can, on a tithing envelope, if you use one of those, you can write missions trip. You got to put missions trip. If you just put missions, it goes somewhere different. Put missions trip. You can also go to our website at uh, www.morningstardayton.org and it has an icon that says give now and you can select Guatemala missions trip and give however much God lays on your heart to do that. But I'm going to challenge you, either go or give so someone can go in your place. And I'm excited about this trip. I can't wait to see what God does in the lives of people who are going and also in the lives of those of you who give so others can go because this is a all, we're all included in this. And I can't wait to, to be a part of that. So a lot, a lot going on at our church and we want you to stay on top of that. So please turn on the connection card and we'll make sure we get to that information. But right now is a special day. I, I love these kind of days. And right now I'm gonna invite the Nemos to come on and join me up front here for just a moment. So this morning we get to do what we call a baby dedication. And we've got uh, the Nemos here who are dedicating their two little ones. We've got Reed and Jessa, and, and I'm excited about this. So let me just really briefly explain what we're doing here. For those of you, maybe you're new to church, like what world's going on here? This does not have anything to do with salvation. This does not have anything to do with Jessa or Reed going to heaven. It has nothing to do with that. This is actually more for you two than it is for the children. Because what we're doing, we, we call it a baby dedication, but really what it is, it's a parent dedication. Because we're gonna pray over this couple, over this amazing family this morning, and I'm gonna ask you just a moment, when I pray for the offering, I'm gonna pray over you guys, I'm gonna invite our church family to join with me in your own heart where you're at and lift up this family. Because you, know, you guys know what, our, what we're facing in this world, what our children are facing right now and what they're going through, the amount of kids that are walking away from their faith, the amount of kids that are losing their identity in Christ and following along with what the world has to offer. And so this is a big deal. And you two have set this apart and you want to dedicate your children to the Lord. And where we get this from is from the Old Testament where Hannah and Elkanah prayed and begged God for a child. And they, they had a child named Samuel, and they actually brought Samuel to the, back to the temple, uh, and they dedicated him back to the Lord. And that's what you guys are doing this morning. And so I'm going to warn you to this morning. <laughs> when, you, when you're standing up here right now, I want you to remember this day, because one day, God just might call one of your children to full-time ministry. He might just call one of your children to full-time missions. And you're today saying, God, they're yours. They're not ours. And you never know, and I know you guys are super faithful and you're going to raise them in church. And our prayer is that they come to know Jesus as a early, at an early age and can't wait to see what God does with them. And so today we're going to pray a prayer of dedication over you two that you guys raise them and love them. And they see the love of Christ coming from you. And they know what God's love really means. And they know what it means to be a part of a church family. And as a church family, we love you. And we're super happy for, for you guys and for your little ones. And I'm excited to be a part of this. And we have just a little something for both of them and to kind of help get them started. A little Bible for both of them and a card. And that card, I know, I know you're welcome. 
You're welcome. I know neither one of you can read, but <laughs> mom and dad can read the card too, and I want you guys to hold on to that and stick it in their Bible because um, just God is our, this is a church family, and we're all about families. We're all about our children, and this is a big deal. And, I, and I'm super, super happy for you, all right? So I'm going to invite the usher to come forward this morning. We're going to pray a prayer of dedication over this family. I'm going to invite you to join praying with me for the Nemos today and for their little ones, that God will protect their little ones, that God will shield their hearts, that God will have them and tug at their hearts at a young age to come and give their life to him, and that God's going to use them in a way to change this world for Jesus Christ, all right? So let's go ahead and pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity that what a humbling thing it is to be able to share in this, this moment with this family, a family that is so sweet and so amazing and you've already done so much through them, but now you've blessed them with two precious little ones that now they're standing before their church family, they're standing before you, God, and they're offering their children back to you. But really what they're doing is they're offering their own hearts to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of, of you. I pray for faithfulness for Jeff and for Meredith that you just will pour your love out to them as they pour their love out to their kids. God, we pray for Reed and for Jessa and for the amazing plans that you have for them. We know in your word, you told us that you knit us together in our mother's womb, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's no different for these two amazing little ones this morning. And so God, we pray for this family, you protect them that God, you guide them, that you give Jeff and Meredith the wisdom as they raise their kids, as they go through the difficult teenage years, as they go through the young adulthood, as they raise these little ones to love you like they love you. And that as a church family, we'll join with them and help them. And we'll love them. We'll speak truth into their children's lives with them. We'll be role models for them. We'll, we'll love them just as much as Jeff and Meredith love their kids. God, we love you. Thank you for today. We pray for this offering this morning, Lord, that you will bless it to further your message of hope and restoration, both here in Centerville, but also around the world, for your glory. God, pray bless those who are able to give this morning. Bless our visitors that are here today. God, help all of us today to leave here changed and challenged from your word that we're not gonna be okay with status quo anymore, that our whole lives are all dedicated to you for your praise and glory. And we give it all to you in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, our kids can also be dismissed to Kid City. And as we get ready to sing another song, um, this next song really just focuses on, on that, very much what we were just talking about. We're leading our children to follow Christ, but sometimes we have to take a second and stop and say, who have I made the supreme one in my life? Who have I made the most important one in, in my life? And really, that who is the king of my heart. So we're going to sing this song, King of My Heart, this morning. Thank 
drink from, you're where we find our, our rest, where, you're where we find our refreshment, you're where we find our substance. Lord, it's not just a place that, that we go to Sunday, but Lord, you are our everything. You are the king, the driving force of our hearts. And so, Lord, we ask that in this moment that you would change us because of your word, that you'd make us different because of who you are. We love you. We praise you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Amen. Well, once again, good morning. I'm so glad that you're here. And if you've been with us over the last several weeks, we just finished a series that we called The Mountain, where we walk through the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7. And this week, we're going to actually back up just a little bit. So we're actually going to be in Matthew chapter 4. So hopefully you brought your Bibles with you this morning. If not, you can pull it up on your phone. But we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. And the, the background of this is in chapter 3, uh, Jesus is, he, he's starting his ministry. He gets baptized by John the Baptist. And I don't know if you remember that passage, but uh, when John the Baptist, when he baptizes Jesus, the, the people around him heard the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. And then it says that the, the glory of God came and descended from heaven like a dove. So it was quite the, the moment in time where Jesus got baptized. And then right after that, he, he fasted for 40 days and was led into this, the wilderness um, where he was tempted by Satan. And after that is where we pick up our passage here in Matthew chapter 4. Look at verse 17. It says, from then on, so this is after, after he's been baptized, after he was, was in the wilderness and was tempted. It says, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And I, I love that because we went to camp on Thursday night where the teenagers were at and the camp speaker was using that word repent. I love that. It's a churchy word. I get it. But without repentance, there is no salvation. Without us saying, you know what, I, here's the way I'm going. Here's, here's who I am and my sin and my brokenness. Without us going, hey, this is not right. When the Holy Spirit convicts us, we turn away from that. We don't just change our mind. Well, I'll try something else. It's a turning away from that and going towards Jesus, wanting more of Jesus. And that's what Jesus starts preaching. 
Repent. You got to turn away from that. Like I'm calling you to a new life, but you got to turn away from your old one. And then he goes to verse 18. And it says, as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. Verse 19 says, follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, and they were mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. And we've looked at this passage before from the aspect of what it means like to abandon everything and follow Jesus. But we're going to focus on a different part of that passage here this morning. And talking about this idea of of being a a disciple. When I... I, don't say it out loud. Just think about this first. When I say the word Christian, what comes to your mind? Like when I just said that word Christian, what's the first thing that popped in your mind? What are, you, what are you envisioning? What do you see? What are you imagining when you hear that word Christian? Because we call ourselves Christians, right? So we probably should hopefully know what that means. But what, what do you think of? Do you think of like somebody like the suit and tie and, like, like and, and going to church? Or what, what do you think about? I mean, there's let me, let me, let's, let's prime the pump a little bit. Here's the deal. Let me start with the easier ones. Okay. Don't say it out loud because I don't want anybody to be embarrassed this morning. All right. But when I say the word liberal, what do you think of? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? All right. A lot of laughter. There's a snort too. All right. So, all right. That's great. Okay. What about if I say conservative, right? What comes to your mind? Don't cheer. All right. So I heard somebody go, yeah. All right. So what comes to your mind when you say Republican? All right. That's different. Republican. What comes to your mind when you say Democrat? What comes to your mind when we say the word vegetarian? In Texas, we call them bad hunters, but that's okay. Um, That's all right. But what do you think? I mean, what do you think of? You know what? We all have an image that comes to our mind when I say these words, don't we? Right? What about if I say Ohio State fan? What do you think of when I say Ohio State fan? Good person, right? Right? Or if I say Michigan fan, right? Michigan, Ohio State, you know who you're thinking about. It's okay, right? What if I say Texan? Some of you guys are thinking about your crazy pastor. Some of you, I see some hands raised because we got some recent converts from Texas, right? It's awesome. Um, when I met Mandy for the first time in Springfield, Missouri at college, and we were introducing ourselves, hey, here's where I'm from, and I told her I'm from Texas. Immediately she looked down to see if I was wearing cowboy boots. First thing, and she'll tell you, that's the first thing she looked at because she grew up here in Ohio and apparently there's a stereotype that everybody from Texas wears cowboy boots and belt buckles. I own both, but I, weren't, I wasn't wearing them that day, okay? So, but it was, when, I say tech, when I say New Yorker, what comes to mind? What do you think of when you say the word New Yorker? Okay, how about this? Best superhero movie franchise. Immediately, some of you guys went to Marvel, Right? The rest of you who don't love Jesus went to D.C., okay, right? Some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's okay. It's all right. But when we say things, we automatically have an idea of what that is. So let's go back to our original question. Again, think about it. What, what What comes to mind when you use the word or you think of the word Christian? See, if you were to walk down the street right now, I guarantee you, like everybody here jogs, and it makes me really convicted because I don't jog. And so um, when I drive down Centerville, and if you left right now, there'll be people jogging or walking their dog somewhere, and you can go up to them right now and ask them, hey, are you a Christian? And since we're kind of in the little upper Midwest, chances are when you ask them, are you a Christian, they're going to say, well, yeah, of course I am. But they really don't have any idea what it means. And you'll ask some, if you ask the same question, you might get some people who say, well, what are you talking about? Some people might say, yes, but I'm not like, and they want to quantify it with who they're not like. You'll get some that say, well, n- no, I'm, I'm really not. And some of you this morning hopefully would say that at some point you became a Christian. There was a point in your life where you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Some of you, maybe you just prayed a prayer or walked an aisle or got baptized. Some of you would say, well, I've been a Christian since I was born. And that one kills me because, no, you haven't, <laughs> Okay. I, and I've talked to people all over the country, and I, I like to hear people's stories. I'm like, hey, tell me about when you got saved. Tell me about that moment where, and, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to somebody like, well, I was born and raised a Christian. No, you're not born a Christian. The Bible makes it very clear. We're born separated from God. You're not born a Christian. You're born again to be a Christian. But you're not born a Christian. 
And so listen, there, there's that, give me that moment. And some of you this morning, maybe you were tricked into coming to church this morning, all right? Maybe somebody bribed you with a really good lunch. Maybe some of you kids, your parents threatened you with bodily harm if you didn't get out of bed to come to church, and maybe that's why you're here. Uh, but some of you would even say this morning, no, you know, honestly, I'm not. I, I know for sure I'm not. I want to tell you I'm glad you're here. Because I want to share something very interesting with you. Something that maybe some of you have never heard before, but it's really interesting that the very first followers of Jesus did not call themselves Christians. Did you know that? When Jesus was here and he died and they buried him and he rose again and the church was getting going and he was talking to all these disciples and even when he went back to heaven, do you realize that church did not call themselves Christians? Christians was actually a slang term. It was a derogatory put down. It was a slam against people who were followers of Christ. They did not call themselves Christian. It was, it was actually from an outside group who called, it, called these guys Christians to make fun of them. Acts eleven twenty six 26 tells us that a group of believers at Antioch were, were the ones who were first called Christians. The term really, what it meant was, that made it slang, it was calling you a little Jesus. Oh, you're just a little Jesus walking around, aren't you? You just want to be like that guy, that, that, that Nazarene right, that they, they crucified. You're just a little Jesus. That's, that's how they said it. That's what that term meant. It means that you're a little Jesus. And, but what did they call themselves? They didn't call themselves Christians. You know what they called themselves? Disciples. They called themselves disciples. They referred to themselves. So if we were to transport ourselves back to first century Israel, and run into some of these, these guys, these, these men and women in these churches, they would say, hey, we're disciples. That's what they would say. They would not say we're Christians. They would say we're disciples of Jesus. You know the word Christians act, is actually only used three times in the whole New Testament. Three times, that's it. One right there in Acts eleven twenty six, 26, where it says they were first called Christians at Antioch. The next time is in Acts 26, 28, where the apostle Paul was standing before King Agrippa, and he was sharing his faith. He was speaking the gospel to King Agrippa. And at the end, I don't know if you remember the end of the sentence, King Agrippa looks at Paul and he says, oh, Paul, you almost got me. You almost persuaded me to become one of you little Jesus people. It was a put down. He said, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. He used the slang, the put down term. That's the second time it appears. The third time is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, where Peter encourages those who are being persecuted for being Little Jesuses. That's the only three times the word Christian even appears in the New Testament. The word disciple appears over 269 times in the New Testament. Okay, so what I'm not saying this morning is stop calling yourself a Christian. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying leave, don't leave, go, oh, I can't use that word anymore. That's not what we're saying. It was a slang term that, to make fun of them, and what they did was they embraced it. They're like, yeah, that's exactly who we are. We want to be a little Jesus. We want to be Jesus-like. We want to be these little Jesus running around and sharing our faith. It was a badge of honor to them. But today, let's be very honest today in, in, in this room, is that the word Christian has really become very watered down in our nation, in our world. Because everybody labels themselves a Christian now. Like you can run into anyone who claims they're a Christian. You can run into somebody and say, well, I went to mass once and I was, I was blessed by a priest, so I'm a Christian. You can run into somebody who says, well, I was confirmed as a child. I went through the confirmation classes and, and they had this little graduation ceremony, so I'm a Christian. You have some people who say, well, I was christened as a baby, so I'm a Christian. Or I was baptized as an infant or a child or a teenager, so I'm a Christian. This one kills me. Well, I sent money to a preacher once and he told me that I'm blessed and I can go to heaven, so I'm a Christian. I prayed a prayer, I sang a song, I wore a special garment, I paid a certain amount of money. I know John 3, 16, by heart, I got, I'm a Christian. I know Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, I'm a Christian. I know every hymn in the hymnal, so I'm a Christian. I know all three chords to every worship song, I'm a Christian, right? The music people get that, it's okay. But the meaning of the word disciple is so much clearer. In fact, it's fearfully clearer about what you actually become when you choose to believe in Jesus. Look at verse 17 again. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he look in verse 19. He looks at these guys and he says, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Once you understand a little background of this, here's the deal. So you're like, I don't know if you're like me, but if you read this passage, you're like, okay, so this strange guy walks down this, the shore of Galilee, 
looks at these grown men, says, follow me, and they abandon everything to go follow. Like, it doesn't make any sense. We've got to understand a little bit of the context and the culture here. Jewish boys at this time, around the age of five or six, would go to school to learn the Old Testament. The first five books of the Old Testament is called the Torah. So we'll just call it Torah school, okay? They all went and learned it. They learned Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And it was called Bet Sefer from the age of about 6 to 12. And then they went, if they, if they did really good and they showed a lot of promise, they would move on at the age of 10 to 12 and go to Bet Medrish, where they would go a little deeper and learn even more about the Old Testament. And then if they were really exceptional, about the age of 16, 17, sometimes maybe even 15 if they were really good, they would go to something called Bet Talmud. And here's what that was. That's where they went and they would find a rabbi. They would find a rabbi and they would go and sit at the feet of, and a rabbi just means teacher. They would go find a teacher somewhere and they would go sit down at his feet. And that was their application to join their little group. And so if I'm a rabbi and I'm sitting here and somebody comes and sits at my feet while I'm teaching, when I'm done teaching, I'm going to talk to that young man and I'm going to grill him on a bunch of questions. I'm going to ask him every question I can think of about the Old Testament, about the law, about all these other things. And if if I think they're smart enough and good enough to join my group, then I will invite them to come and follow me. I will invite them to come be a part of my group. Most young men during this time, when they were about the age of 10, would just go back home to dad and learn the family business. And that's where Peter, James, John, and Andrew are. They went through, they learned the five, first five books of the Old Testament, but they went back to become fishermen. But if you followed a rabbi, what would happen is you would follow your rabbi around and you would learn everything about them. If your rabbi ate with his right hand, but you were left-handed, you would eat with your right hand. If your rabbi woke up, woke up at 4.30 every morning to go to the bathroom, you woke up at 4.30 every morning to go to the bathroom. If your rabbi went to bed at 6 o'clock at night with the sun still up, you went to bed at 6 o'clock at night. You learned to talk like your rabbi. You learned to speak, engage, how to hang out, how to converse, how to, how to, how to fit in in certain groups. You did everything like your rabbi. In fact, the highest compliment you could pay to one of these young men following a rabbi during that time was to say this phrase to them, the dust of your rabbi is all over you. Basically, that was like saying that everything your rabbi steps in sprays all over you, okay? Remember, they weren't walking on concrete and asphalt roads. They were walk walking on brick paved roads or stone paved roads, most of the time dirt roads, and they wore sandals. And so when they were walking, they would stir up dust and if you were walking close enough behind them, that dust would get on you. So this phrase of the dust of your rabbi is all over you is really, it's a, it's a word picture. You're following your rabbi so closely that their dust is covering you. In other words, you're just like your rabbi. You're just like him. You're getting covered with it. So back to Matthew 4. Here comes Jesus who knows the Torah so well that when he was 12, he was in the temple, you remember the story, and he was correcting the grown men about their theology. He was correcting these men about uh, what they believed. People are constantly amazed at his authority. In fact, Matthew chapter 7, where we finished up our Sermon on the Mount series, verse 29, said that he spoke with authority unlike anybody who was speaking at the time. Luke chapter 20, we see all these religious leaders asking Jesus, who gave you this authority? Who gave you this power? Because it's just it, because he's a son of God, it was just coming out of him. Like when he spoke, it just couldn't help but people be drawn to him. And these guys were going, who gave you that? Like, this isn't right. Somebody had to give you that. You had to learn that from somewhere. Who gave that to you? They just couldn't understand. And then in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, after he calls his disciples, look at it. Jesus was going all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So not only was this authority just pouring out of him, he had power. So we have to understand that, that as this is just before this, Jesus was baptized and God spoke and everybody heard it and, and the, the glory of God came and descended above him. And so here's Jesus, this new rabbi, and he's exploding with power and authority. And he chooses, he walks down the Sea of Galilee and he points to some ordinary guys who washed out of Torah school. And he points them and says, you, I want you to follow me. You, I want you to follow me. You and you. And if, so, of course, these guys are going to follow him because this is a rabbi seeking them out, which was unheard of, especially for the rabbi to seek out fishermen because this is the B team, right? This is not the rock star team. And when I was growing up in, in, in Texas in middle school in seventh and eighth grade, we had a, a, a football A team and a football B team and a basketball A team and a basketball B team. 
you knew which team you were on. You know what I'm saying? Like if you were really skilled and really big and built and you were one of those guys in seventh grade who was already growing a beard, you were on the A team, right? I was not so lucky, <laughs> okay? But he chooses the B team. He chooses a bunch of fishermen. And here's, I love this. He skipped over all the all-stars, all the new up-and-comers from the other, other schools that were around and went straight for the fishermen. So, of course, they wanted to follow him. They wanted to follow this rabbi who had chosen them. He chose them to follow him, to become like him, to know God like he knew God, to do what he did and be filled with his power. So three things from this passage I want to pull out because I want us to understand this this morning. The first thing is this. Jesus doesn't choose the best. He chooses the willing. If you mark in your Bible, if you underline your Bible, right there in the margin where it says that he went to the fisherman, just write the word willing. Because Jesus doesn't choose the best. He chooses the willing. Here's what I love. John MacArthur says it this way. He says, in choosing his disciples, Jesus skipped all the whys of the day. Whys, W-H-Y, like why you would pick somebody. Here's what he says. The great scholars were in Egypt. The great library was in Alexandria. The great philosophers were in Athens. The powerful were in Rome. He passed over Herodotus, the historian, Socrates, the great thinker, and Julius Caesar, the great ruler. And he chose men to be his disciples so ordinary, it was comical. Not one single rabbi, not one single teacher, no religious experts, not even a Pharisee. Half of them were fishermen, one was a tax collector, and Simon the Zealot was a troublemaker by trade. Look it up, read about him, it's pretty interesting. I love that quote. Jesus skipped over all the why, why you would choose someone, and he went straight for the ordinary. So ordinary, it was funny. He chose this group because his work would not come from their abilities, but would come from what he would do through them. Jesus chose these guys because, not because of the, 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 his work that would come from their abilities, but from what he would do through them. What does that mean? It means Jesus didn't choose you because you're awesome. <laughs> He wants to make you awesome for him because he chose you. So the question is not how able are you. The question is and always has been how available are you. The question is not how able or how talented or how amazing you are. The question is how available are you. Have you really surrendered yourself to God enough to say, God, I'm going to stop making excuses I'm going to stop looking into my family. I'm going to stop looking into my marriage. I'm going to stop looking into my ministry. I'm going to stop looking into my workplace. I'm going to stop looking into my community and asking, what can John do? And instead, I'm going to look into my marriage, and I'm going to look into my family. I'm going to look into my community. I'm going to look into my street and my neighborhood, and I'm going to say, what can Jesus do? Because I can't do anything. I have no power. I've got nothing so I need to stop looking at every situation and being discouraged by it because I look at it and go, well, I can't really do anything. I can't really fix my marriage. I can't really fix my kids. I can't really fix my neighborhood. I can't really fix my job. But I can start looking at all those areas and go, but what can Jesus do? He, doesn't, he chose, but he doesn't choose the best. He chooses the willing. And John, Jesus says in John chapter 15, in verse 16, you don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll read it for you. John chapter 15 in verse 16, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you that you should go out and produce fruit. If you mark in your Bible, I want you to put a box around that phrase, produce fruit. And that your fruit should remain, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. And then verse 17, he finishes it up by saying, This is what I command you, love one another. And earlier he says, I command you to love one another as I have loved you. Well, he loved us enough to go to the cross to die for us, and he commands us to love others enough to tell them about that story. Does that make sense? He says, I command you, I want you, I point you as you go out and bear fruit. Bear fruit means that you're going to win other people to Jesus. That's what it means. You're going to reproduce in others what Jesus has done in you. So here's the deal. So when you lack confidence in yourself, you should, you should put your confidence in Jesus' promises to you. Because even if you fail, even if I fail, the purposes of Jesus will never fail. So if I'm lacking confidence, if I'm losing confidence to talk to my neighbor, if I'm losing confidence to talk to my family member, if I'm losing confidence to do anything, one, I quit looking at myself for confidence, and I need to put my confidence in Jesus who said he's going to do it through me. 
Here's where our confidence fails. A lot of times we talk about we lost our confidence or we lost our faith in Jesus, but it's really not our faith in Jesus that we've lost. What we've really lost is our faith that Jesus would do through us what he said he would do. When I'm nervous or I'm scared and it keeps me from sharing my faith, keeps me from spreading the gospel, I haven't lost my faith in Jesus. I've lost my faith that Jesus is going to do through me what he said he was going to do. A great example of this is Matthew chapter 14, just a few chapters from here, where the disciples are in the boat and it's stormy, but Jesus isn't with them. And all of a sudden Jesus comes walking on the water and Peter says, Jesus, if it's you, invite me to step out of the boat and come to you. And Jesus says, come on. And Peter starts walking on the water and everything is awesome without busting into the Lego movie song, right? So everything is awesome. And then all of a sudden he starts seeing the wind and he starts seeing the waves and he starts to sink. And we look at that and we go, aha, Peter lost his faith in Jesus. No, he didn't. Because Peter still saw Jesus walking on the water. And Peter calls out to Jesus to save him. Peter didn't lose his faith in Jesus. Peter lost his faith that Jesus could make him walk on water. There's a big difference. Where your confidence, confidence usually falters is not in the character of Jesus, it's in the promise of Jesus to do through you what he said he's going to do. You're fully convinced, and I'm fully convinced, that if Jesus was married to my spouse, if Jesus was married to your spouse, he would be the greatest spouse in the world, right? We're fully convinced that if Jesus was raising our kids, he wouldn't make any mistakes. He'd be awesome. We're fully convinced that if Jesus was working at our workplace, he wouldn't have any trouble spreading the good news and the gospel. But that's not what Jesus promised. Jesus promised to do that through you and through me. That's where our confidence usually lags. What you need to remember is faithful is he who calls you who also will do it. That he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. We see in Philippians 1.6 that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1 in verse 12, Paul's talking to a young preacher. And he says this, he says, uh, and that is why I suffer these things for I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. God doesn't choose the best. He chooses the available and the willing. Second thing this morning is this. Our primary calling is to be with Jesus. Our primary calling is to be with Jesus. Go back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Two words, follow me. Draw a box around it. Underline it. In our English, that's two words, follow me. But in the Greek, it's three words. It's dute apesoma. Don't ask me to say it again, okay? Just trust me. Dute apasama. And what it means is, it means, it literally means this. Here, behind me. Come here, follow me. And it, it, here is actually like an exclamation. It's like, hey, you, come here. I want you to follow me. I want you to get behind me and go where I go. And I love that. And he didn't tell them where they're going. <laughs> you notice that? He just said, follow me. He didn't tell them where they're going or what assignment that they would have because his primary call on you and on me is not to do something. It's to become like him. A lot of times we think we gotta do, do, do to please God. And Jesus says, follow me. And then I'll make you be fishers of men. But the command is to follow him, to be with him. So God's plan for your life is not for you to do something. His plan is for you to become like Jesus. But to become like him, you got to know him. And to know him, you got to spend time with him. And to spend time with him means that you soak in every single word that comes out of his mouth, to be covered in the dust of our rabbi. And we offer a lot of ways to get involved with that here at Morningstar. We've got weekly messages like you're sitting through right now. We've got small groups that are going to start up here in about a really short couple of months. We've got mentoring opportunities. We've got Bible studies. And if you're serious about being his disciples, then you're going to want to take advantage of these. And not just coming to hear me talk once a week, because promise me, I promise you, it's going to drive you crazy, okay? There's so many ways to, be, to soak in what he's saying. You're going, to get, you're going to want to be getting in the word every single day on your own. You're going to be memorizing scripture. You're going to saturate yourself with the word. Do you want the dust of the rabbi all over you? Here's what sometimes I hear. People go to different churches like, well, I don't like that church because I'm not being fed by the pastor. You really know it's your job to feed yourself, right? 
How many of you guys call your mom and dad at home and tell them to come over and feed you? Spoon feed you, right? Look, if, if you're just, look, you can come in and I'm gonna feed, I'm gonna, I'm gonna feed the sheep, I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna preach the word of God, but if that's all you're relying on, that's why you're starving spiritually, not because we're not feeding, because you're not in it. You're not reading it. My job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. My job is to train you to go out and spread the gospel. And it's all of our jobs to be covered in the dust of our rabbi, to soak in every word that Jesus says. And if we're not in this, you won't know what he says. Do you want the dust of the rabbi all over you? Then you're going to have to take, have this word saturating you inside and out until it dominates all of your thinking and all of your behavior until you think it, you talk it, you quote it. Let me, get you, let me hit you with this one. You cannot know Jesus any more than you know this. Do you know that? You cannot know Jesus any more than you know the word of God. That's why we have some believers who've been saved 20, 30, 40 years of their life and they're still baby Christians because they don't know much about Jesus because they really don't get into this. You can't know Jesus any more than you know his word. Do you want the dust of the rabbi all over you? Then learn his word, and you got to be with him. The third and last thing this morning is this. Jesus commands us. Jesus commands us to reproduce spiritually. Jesus commands us to reproduce spiritually. Look in verse 19 again of Matthew chapter 4. He says, follow me. He told them, and I will make you fish for people. Just like Jesus is a fisher of men, his disciples would become fishers of men. To be a disciple, he commands us to make disciples. This is an essential part of being a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Here's what Jesus did not say. Jesus didn't say, follow me and I'll make you a church member. Jesus did not say, follow me and I'll make you successful. He did not say, follow me, and I will give you your best life now. He did not say, follow me, and I'll make you comfortable. In fact, he says the opposite. Later on, he says, if you follow me, there's going to be some hard times. You're going to have some trouble. He didn't say, follow me, and I'll make you famous. He didn't say, follow me, and I'll make you a nice, comfy building to meet in. He didn't say, follow me, and I'll give you all your preferences and exactly how you want everything. He didn't say any of that. He said, follow me. And I'll give you an identity and a purpose, and that's to go fishing, to fish for people. And it's not meant for something for just a few of us to do. It's something that, according to Jesus, we all do. In fact, Jesus says, if this is not part of what you do, you're not my disciple. Jesus says, if this is not part of what you do, you're not my disciple. And you might be this morning going, oh, man, that's not what Jesus said. Come on, that's a little hard. Okay, go to John 15. In fact, I encourage you to read the whole chapter of John 15, but here's what he says in John 15, verse 8. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit. If you mark in your Bible, I want to mark this, and prove to be my disciples. Now, be very careful. It doesn't mean we have to make disciples to be saved. That's not, we don't work for our salvation. But you want proof of your salvation? Where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? That hurts a little bit. That hurts me a little bit. Jesus says, my Father is glorified in this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Verse 9 says, as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. And if you keep my commands, now, if you read the context of that, the commands of Jesus is to love God and love people. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Verse 12, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. Now, look, he's saying this, and not too long from there, he goes to the cross, He says, love people like I love you. And by the way, I'm loving you. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to give my life for your salvation, for your eternal life. So you then love people enough to share that story with them. Does that make sense? Then in verse 16, 
He says this, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I pointed you that you should go out and produce fruit. There's that phrase again. We just looked at it earlier. And that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask my Father in my name, he will give it to you. This is what I command you, love one another. How are you going to prove that you're his disciple? You're going to bear fruit spiritually. You're going to reproduce spiritually. Which means if you're his disciples, this is going to be a part of your life. And if you're not reproducing spiritually, you have a good reason to go, okay, am I really a follower of Jesus? Because Jesus said, my disciples are going to produce fruit. My disciples, there's going to be evidence of that. The last thing Jesus said before he left this earth was Matthew 28, 19, where he says, go into all the world and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost, and teach them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. So in the Greek, let me get a little nerdy on you this morning. The word go, baptize, and teach, they're all participles. They're not the main verb in that text in the Greek. The center of all the going and baptizing and teaching is found in the one verb in there, which is make disciples. Which means that in everything else we do as a church, and everything we do as a follower of Christ, the core of what we do is make disciples. And when we're making disciples, the baptism comes part of it. When we're making disciples, the teaching comes along part of it. When we're making disciples, we're naturally going. But the key verb there is make disciples. Yes, we want to show love and kindness and meet the needs wherever we see them. We want to help the homeless, the orphan, the underprivileged, the unwed mother. But the core of all of that as we help them is teaching them about Jesus. Some of you are moved by the needs of the world, and that is awesome. You're moved by the needs of people all around you. But the greatest need in the world is the need of people to hear about salvation of Jesus. I can take a homeless man off the street and I can give him a brand new home, a nice vehicle. I can give him a job where he's making eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year. I can give him a pension plan. I can give him insurance. I can give him all those things. And he might live 30, 40, 50, 60 more years. But if he dies in his sin, he's going to spend eternity separated from Jesus forever. Separated from God forever in a place called hell. So here's the deal. Did I really help him? Or as I'm helping him, I share the good news with him, and I share the gospel with him, and I speak about hope and forgiveness and new life and eternal life. That's where real help and that's where real relief of suffering comes in. Some of you are moved by the suffering of the refugee and the plight of people all over the world, and that's amazing. But the greatest of all suffering is eternal suffering, which people who are outside of Jesus experience, which means, yes, give your life to meet needs. We're called to do that. Give your life to relieve suffering. But get this, church, listen, lean in. But as a disciple of Jesus, know that the greatest needs you can meet and the greatest suffering you can relieve is the need of people to hear about Jesus and experience the salvation of Jesus. So in all you do, make sure the controlling verb of your life and my life is make disciples. Jesus summarized his ministry in Luke 19 by saying this, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. So if I'm being covered in the dust of my rabbi, if I'm following Jesus as a disciple, shouldn't that be the summary of my life too? That I came to seek and to save that which is lost and point them towards the Savior. God's plan for Centerville, Ohio and the surrounding area are men and women. His plan is not something. God's plan is someone. And it's you. And it's me. We want to see everyone at Morningstar who claims to be a disciple of Jesus by the grace of God become a reproducing Christian. We want to commit right now this weekend to doing this very thing. And I know it's intimidating and it's scary, but don't let it intimidate you because remember, Jesus doesn't call the the best. He calls the willing and it's him that's doing it through us. Disciple making is simply teaching somebody else to follow Jesus. And you're like, I don't understand what that means. Then take this. Here's what it is. It's opening your life up and inviting other people in and sharing with them Jesus. So most important thing today, what I want you to walk away with today is this. Here's the deal. We're called to be disciples, not Christians. And if we're disciples, then our job is to make disciples. So who's your one? Who's your one? 
Who is it that you've been praying for to God lay on your heart to say, I'm going to do everything I can to show them the Savior? Who is it? If you don't have one, start praying for one. I'm going to tell you this, they're all around you. They're everywhere. And it's our job to seek and to save that which is lost, to share with them Jesus. I know you can't control the outcome. I know you can't make someone become a believer. I'm not putting that on you, but I'm saying this. Will you commit to God and say, God, will you show me one person that I'm supposed to reproduce myself in spiritually, that I'm supposed to lead to you or at least show them you? Because what if each believer in our building right now, what if, what if every small group this fall won one person? What would that do? To this area, what would that do for our church? What would that do for the kingdom? Just do one. So the question is this, are you a disciple? Maybe you never understood that until now, but are you actually a disciple or are you just a Christian? Have you committed to follow Jesus? Do you understand that it, who it is that's called you? He didn't just give insights New insights. He, he spoke and the wind and waves obeyed him. He commanded demons and they fled. He spoke to diseases and they were healed. He talked to people in graves and they walked out of the graves. But to, by him all things exist. By his blood they were redeemed. For his glory they were created. According to his purpose they are progressing. He has no rival. He has no equal. If Jesus is who he says he is, doesn't he deserve our total abandonment? If Jesus is who he says he is, the Savior of the world, the Messiah of all time, the Son of the living God, if you and I really believe Jesus is who he says he is, then does he, does he not deserve our total adoration, our longing to be filled with more of Jesus? Doesn't he deserve more than just church attendance? So some of us maybe need to stop being a Christian and actually start being a disciple. The gospel is very simple as this. We couldn't save ourselves. So God stepped out of heaven and took on the form of man. And Jesus lived the perfect sinless life and gave his life for us. Died the death that you and I should have died. So that if we put our faith and trust in him and give our life to Jesus, repent from who we were and turn towards Jesus, that we can have eternal life. And not just that, but a new life. And I don't care what prayer you prayed. I don't care what kind of family you grew up in. The question is always, have you become his disciple? Have you received him and surrendered your will to him? And the question is, the next question is, if your answer is yes, the next question is, are you engaging in the mission then of being a disciple? The call to follow Jesus and the call to make disciples is one and the same. Let me leave you with this, and we're going to finish up with this right here. Jesus benchmarked his ministry with three different sayings. He started his ministry by saying, come and see. Come check this out. About midway through his ministry, he started using the phrase, come and die. And not like, come kill yourself, but die to yourself. Say, it's not about me, it's about, it's about God. And so I'm going to put myself aside and be consumed with Jesus. So he started off by saying, come and see. Then he says, come and die. And for those that came and died, then he said this when he left, now go and tell. Come and see, come and die, now go and tell. And some of us this morning, we're still stuck in the come and see part. We're still stuck in the, wow, this is awesome, and God is so awesome, and he is awesome, and he is amazing. But some of us have been stuck there for years, and we haven't done the last part, which is go and tell. And we not, we're not going and telling because some of us really haven't died to ourselves. It's still about us. It's still about our, it's still about our comfort and our success, and it's still about our family, and it's about our friends. And Jesus like, but you're stuck because a disciple makes disciples Found people, find people. Saved people, save people. Loved people, love people. So are you really a disciple? My prayer is that yes, we all are. Maybe some of us are just stuck in some area. Then today, let's start going and telling. Who's your one? 
Maybe this morning while I was talking, God laid someone on your heart. Maybe it's the person you buy coffee from. Maybe it's the person, your favorite restaurant you go to. Maybe it's your neighbor or your coworker. Here's what I want you to do. In the margin of your Bible, if you have your Bibles open, right there in Matthew chapter four, where he says, follow me, I want you to write their name in the margin. Pray for them. Ask God to open those doors of opportunity so you can show love to them. You can show Jesus to them. If you don't write down, it's not gonna happen. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't really keep yourself accountable, it's not gonna happen. It's just another sermon on another Sunday. But are we gonna be Christians, Morningstar, or are we gonna be disciples? Because disciples make disciples. I'm done being just the ordinary Christian. It's time for all of us, including me, to step up and go and tell. So where are you at? Let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment this morning. Our band's going to come, and they're gonna, we're going to have a time of response. We're going to have a time of worship. And here's the deal. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what season of life you're in. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your family's going through. I don't know what area you might be stuck in. I don't know. Maybe you're stuck in the come and see part. Maybe you're struggling with, I don't know if I can really give up my life to, to share my faith. Can I just tell you this morning, I'm praying for you. And I love you. I, listen, my heart breaks for Christians and believers who go their whole life just having the title Christian and not really living it because you're missing out. Jesus was a lot more straightforward in his responses than what you might hear sometimes from people who just want to talk about how Jesus was all loving, and he was. And Jesus only said easy, good things, and he said a lot of easy, good things, but Jesus said a lot of hard things. And one of them was, prove you're my disciple. He says, the world's going to know you're my disciple for the love you have for them. And the love we should have for them is the same love that Jesus had for them, which means I'm going to lay my life down. I'm going to give up myself to go win them. I'm going to give up myself to go give them the gospel. So maybe you're here this morning and you're stuck. You're like, man, I just, I can't. Maybe your confidence is shaken. Maybe you tried it once. You're like, it did not turn out well. Listen, it's not about you. It's all about what Jesus is going to do through you. And you can't control how they respond, but we can control our obedience. And the command that my Savior gave me and the command that your Savior gave you is to go and tell. Go and tell. So this morning, in just a moment, we're going to pray. And I'm going to invite you this morning. Maybe God has worked in your heart this morning like he's worked in mine. Maybe God has stirred, maybe God has put the name or faces of people in your mind right now, even as we've gone through this, like, who's your one? Who are you going to go and start going and telling to? Then this morning, will you give that to him? We can have immediate obedience this morning and say, God, I, I'm going to respond in my own heart to what you have you've moved in my life. Then do that. Maybe you want to come forward when we start singing and just get down on your knees and say, God, whoever that is that you laid on my heart, God, give me an opportunity to share and go and tell them. Maybe God's moved your heart that, man, I'm, just, I'm guilty of just being a Christian and not really being a disciple. Maybe this morning God's just really burdened you with, I want the dust of my rabbi all over me. I want to be so close to Jesus that I look just like him, that I talk just like him, that I love just like him. But maybe some of us kind of gone through life and we're trying to shake off some of the dust of Jesus because it kind of gets uncomfortable over, after a while. I don't know how God's dealt with you. Maybe this morning you've never given your life to Jesus. I would love to introduce you to the Savior today. And it's all about asking him to forgive you because he died for it, he paid for it. And turning away from that and putting your faith and trust in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection and asking him to save and rescue you. This morning, if you'd like to do that, I would love to talk to you about that. I don't know how God's dealt with you. So you respond how God leads you to respond, right there at your seat or down here in the front. But the worst thing we can do today is not respond at all. Are you a disciple or are you a Christian? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for who you are, for the blood that you shed for us, for the love that you've shown to us. And I pray this morning that as your word is spoken today, that follow me that still rings and it echoes 2,000 years later and, it, and it's, it's bouncing off the walls of our heart. 
that some of us this morning might be feeling some conviction, some tugging in our heart to, to be more like you. Maybe some of this morning, God, that you've talked to, that you've, you've dealt with this morning, they're stuck. God, break them free today. And for the names and the faces that you've brought to our attention right now, God, I pray that you will give us that burden to continue to pray for them, and to start those conversations, and to speak your amazing message of hope to them for your glory. So God, give us the courage to respond however you choose for us to respond this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me and worship this morning?